Welcome to the Rockbrook Church Podcast. Our hope is that today's message brings you hope and clarity for your spiritual journey. We love hearing how God is working in your life. Feel free to share any stories of how this message gave you a new perspective and hope. Email us at church at rockbrook.org to tell your story. Well, good morning. Good to see all of you here today. Welcome to week two of our 40 days of prayer uh, spiritual growth campaign. Uh, You know, it's been a powerful week, first week, as uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of us have been meeting in small groups, and uh, we've been working our way through the daily prayer journals. I'm really enjoying this. Are you guys enjoying this? This, That's good. Yeah, me too. It's really been awesome. And uh, God has been moving here over the last few weeks at Rockbrook. We've actually had uh, several people have let us know that they've uh, accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior just recently. Uh, That's always exciting. Last weekend, uh, we baptized six people, uh, kids, teenagers, and adults. And uh, so we're excited about that. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. And uh, we're doing some parent-child dedications this weekend. That's always a sweet time to see these Young families come and commit themselves to raising their kids to love and and follow God. And uh, this is our online service. Let's all of us here, let's greet everybody out there uh, online. That's good. We love you guys, even though you're not here. And uh, it's fun for me. I'm preaching this weekend here, and I'm also preaching next weekend. And, uh, uh, but last night and next Saturday night, uh, I'm going to be preaching in New Delhi, India. Uh, last night at midnight, because it's 10.30 in the morning, uh, Sunday morning there at midnight here, and so I got to uh, sign online on Zoom. I had 95 families uh, show up on Zoom and, and uh, got to preach for them. It was up till 1.30 uh, last night, and, uh, and came here this morning for my small group at 7.45, so uh, that's a pretty tough schedule for this old bird. Uh, so I'm a night owl and I'm an early bird, which means I'm wise and I've got worms, and uh, so you might pray for me. <laughs> a shout out to Jordan Muchow for that line. I didn't come up with that one. Last week in the first of this 40 Days of Prayer sermon series, Pastor Ryland laid out for us three key needs that we hope to meet uh, during this campaign. And uh, we, we need power, not just words. We need an encounter with God, not just an explanation. And we need presence, uh, not just practice. We need power, encounter, and presence. And so today, it's my privilege to uh, help you see how these three concepts play out in what I think is one of the greatest encounters between a man and God in all of human history. If uh, you want to know what it's like to encounter God, uh, look at the life of Moses. Uh, look at Moses' encounter. In Exodus 33, 11, we read this. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. It says, the Lord would speak to Moses, say the phrase with me, face to face as a man speaks with his friend. Uh, you know, what, there, there's an intimacy. There is a closeness uh, when Moses spoke with God. It's like God was right there in front of him, face to face. Just Well, actually, he'd be six feet away. face to face, uh, just like a friend. And now, now, why is this kind of close encounter with God uh, so important? Because if you're not careful, your Christian life can be reduced to the point where it's based solely on what you believe and what you think in your head. Now, what you think in your head and what you believe in your head is tremendously important. In fact, we emphasize that a lot around here. Recently, we did a, you know, renewing your mind, changing the way you think. I mean, that's crucial. But the great commandment says we are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so it is to be a deeply personal, multifaceted experience with God. And so we need to encounter God's power and his presence. You know, that's why the Apostle Paul, when he went to the Corinthian church, he says, I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. As a pastor, preacher, I understand that. Okay, that's how I come out here every every time. 
And my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. Now, if you can read the sermons of Paul, and Paul was wise, and Paul could be very persuasive. But he says, that, that, that's not how I came to you, you Corinthians. He says, I came with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. You know, Paul came with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. He wanted them to have a close encounter with God. And so in Exodus 33, 11, Moses tells us that, that when he talked to God, he talked face to face with God like a friend. But, but that's in chapter 33 of the story. You know, Moses didn't start out face to face with God. It took him a little while to get there. And so today I want us to go back to the beginning of Moses' story in Exodus chapter 3. And you may remember before Moses was born, the, the Israelites came down into the land of Egypt because there was a famine in Israel and they were all starving. And so they came down and Joseph uh, helped them get enough food and helped them settle in the land of Egypt. But then as time went on, they became slaves to the Egyptians. And the Bible tells us, in fact, they were slaves to the Egyptians for 400 years. But during that time, God was still blessing them even as they were slaves. And they began to grow as a people. They began to have babies and babies and babies and babies. And they were growing as a people, growing as a nation, to the point that they became a threat to the Egyptians. The Egyptians were afraid that they would become so powerful that they would take over. And so Pharaoh came up with a, a scheme that to thin them out by killing off a generation of babies. And he told the Hebrew midwives, he says, whenever a Jewish woman has a baby, we want you to kill the baby. Kill the baby. That's how evil this was. But Moses' mother, when she had Moses, she quickly uh, wrapped him up, put him in a little basket, and put him, hit him in the bulrushes and the reeds in the Nile River near where Pharaoh's daughter came down to the river with her handmaidens to bathe and swim and enjoy the river. And so Pharaoh's daughter found this little baby in the basket and uh, fell in love with him and took him home and raised him in the palace as an Egyptian prince. Now later, as an adult, Moses finds out that he's not really an Egyptian. He's actually a Hebrew. He's one of these enslaved people. And so he goes to visit his people and sees the oppression that they're experiencing. In fact, there's an incident where one of the Egyptian taskmasters is whipping a Jewish slave and Moses intervenes on his behalf and actually kills the Egyptian guy and has to flee because he's going to be charged with murder. And so Moses flees to the far side of the desert and he herded sheep there for 40 years. He's about 40 years old at this time when he leaves. He's 80 years old when we pick up the story in Exodus. You know, in, in our culture, you're 65, maybe even 55. You're ready to retire and, and be done with it all. And uh, Moses gets his calling at the age of 80. It says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. I have no idea how old Jethro was, but he must be a real old dude. Uh, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert. The far side of the desert. If you were to think of your relationship with God, is, is that how you would describe it? God seems far away and dry. Far side of the desert. Moses came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So this is Moses' encounter with the burning bush. And God is notorious for creating strange ways uh, to draw you in. If you want a God who's all neat and orderly and predictable, uh, you're not going to enjoy God very much. Because uh, God likes to do strange things. And it's interesting that he doesn't seem to like to do the same strange thing twice. You know, God does something strange, and, and we want to get all locked into it. You know, we, we think we got God figured out. Oh, okay, the way God appears is through a burning bush. So if you haven't seen a burning bush, you haven't seen God, and you can't hang with us because we're the first church of the burning bush. Okay? But you've got to be careful. You can't lock God into how he, you think he should operate. Because God won't stay in your box. 
You know, God, God speaks through the burning bush one time. He speaks through a cloud of smoke, through a pillar of fire. He speaks through the rushing, sound of rushing waters. He speaks in a still, small voice. You know, one time he spoke through a donkey. I say one time. Actually, God does that a lot. Okay? <laughs> so, so God appeared to Moses in a burning bush. And, and that's strange. You know, whenever God does something strange... You have to decide how you're going to react to it. And here's what Moses decided. So Moses thought, I'll go over and see this strange thing. Why, why the bush does not burn up? And so he decides to go over and check it out. And when the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look. You know, when you're on your spiritual journey and God does something strange and you decide that I'm going to investigate this, I'm going to check it out, God sees that. God sees that and he likes it. He likes that. And so may, maybe for you, coming to this service today, maybe for you, watching a, a church service online, maybe that's a strange uh, occurrence, a strange experience. You, you haven't been to a church that looks or sounds like this. You haven't watched church online before. And, and maybe the idea that you can meet God face to face, maybe that seems strange to you. But when you respond to what God is doing in your life and when you investigate it, God likes that. He likes it. So when Moses went over to investigate this strange thing, God called to him from within the bush. You, you take a step to investigate this strange thing. You, you come to the service. You get in a small group. You say, you know, I'm going to pray for 40 days. I've never prayed for 40 days straight in my life, but I'm going to do this strange thing. And God speaks to you through that strange thing. And so my prayer this week has been that God would speak to you, to you, through, through this service. Because that's what God does here for Moses. God says, Moses, Moses. Moses says, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. God is communicating to Moses, but, but, but this is something special here. This is a special moment. This is a special, a holy moment, a holy encounter. And, and honestly, that's what we try to do for you each weekend. Is, is we, with our songs, with our sermons, that we try to create a special, a holy moment where you can encounter God. And, and that's why I, I would plead with you to lean in, lean in to worship. Sing, clap your hands, lift your voice, lift your hands. You know, take notes on the message and the, the outline or on the app. Just lean in because that's how you encounter God. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. Don't miss this. Exodus 3, Moses hid his face from God. Exodus 33, Moses talks to God face to face. Moses went from, I don't know you, I'm afraid of you, I can't even look at you, hiding his face, to talking to God face to face. What moved Moses? from hiding his face from God to talking face to face to God. I want us to look at four breakthroughs that Moses had, four, four spiritual breakthroughs that, that enabled him to encounter God. And, and let's see how you can have those breakthroughs too. So on your notes, first, Moses says, who am I? You know, the first breakthrough that Moses had was in the area of his own identity, the area of his own identity. Uh, insecurity, his own shortcomings. Because he says, I, I, obviously, God, you've not been watching my life. I mean, you know, I, I'm in exile. I'm a murderer. I, I, I'm way out here on the far side of the desert. You have picked the wrong guy. Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Because that's what God wanted him to do. And Moses says, who am I to do that? And you would think that God would answer the question and, and tell Moses, well, this is who you are. But instead, look what he says. He's, God said, I will be with you. And God turns the attention off of Moses' character on to God's character. He turns the attention off of Moses' weaknesses onto God's power and strength. You see, we, we think we can only get as close to God as we're worthy but none of us are worthy in ourselves. None of us. 
God says, you don't come to me on the basis of your worth. You come to me on the basis of God's worth. You, you don't come to God on the basis of your work. You come to God on the basis of what God has done for you through Jesus Christ, his son. You don't come to God on the basis of what you do. You come to God on the basis of what, what God and Christ and the Holy Spirit have done for you. And it's a crucial distinction because this is how you're drawn into an encounter with God. You know, you can feel, today, you can feel the Holy Spirit inviting you into an experience of worship. Every day when you pray and read, you can feel God just inviting, inviting you in. And what happens is you get here and then in your mind you start rehearsing uh, what, you, what you said on Monday and, and reliving what you did on Tuesday and, and remembering what you thought on Wednesday and recollecting what, what happened on Thursday. And, and as you think about those things, the devil starts bringing up accusations against you. You're going to do what you did last night and then you're going to show up at church this morning and sing and clap? I don't think so. You're not worthy to even be in church. That's, that's the lie that the devil brings to you. I mean, how many times do you talk to someone who, who's an unbeliever, somebody who doesn't go to church, and say, if I went to church, the roof would fall in. If I went to church, the ground would open up and swallow me. If I touched the Bible, it would burst into flames. If I tried to pray, God would strike me with lightning. You ever hear that kind of stuff from people? That's a lie. It's based on a false premise. And so you, you need to break through. You need a breakthrough, a spiritual breakthrough over condemnation. Condemnation. Because condemnation will always keep you from getting close to God. Whether it's Satan's condemnation or whether it's self-condemnation. You know, God does not condemn you. He doesn't. Romans 8.1 says there is no condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. God doesn't condemn you. Satan condemns you. You condemn yourself. Satan, he does it because he's the accuser. He accuses you of your sin because he knows that condemnation will keep you from encountering God. But condemnation is not the way God deals with our sin. In John 3.17, the verse right after John 3.16, the verse that says God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John, John 3, 17 says that God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus Christ didn't come to earth to tell you how bad you are. Jesus Christ came to earth to give you a way out of your badness. He didn't come to condemn you. He came to give you a way out to save you. And so th there's, there's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Condemnation is what, is what Satan and the, the world, the flesh and the devil, that's what they do, they condemn. God and, and the Holy Spirit, they convict. They come to us with conviction. And there's a difference. Condemnation always, always tells you how bad you are. Conviction identifies what you're doing wrong and shows you how to correct it. It identifies what's wrong and shows you a way out. Conviction always leads you out of sin. Condemnation locks you into your sin. So if you're going to encounter God, you cannot do it based on your own worth. It has to be based on God's worth. It cannot be based on your work. It's based on God's work. Titus 3, 4, and 5. Great verse. Uh, let's read this out loud together. But when the kindness of, and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. God saved, not because of the right things we, we do. He saved us because he's merciful. And so the first obstacle to, to encountering God is, well, who am I? Uh, who am I? Well, let me tell you who you are. If you've placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then you are a child of the living God. You are God's son. You are God's daughter. You have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. You have been cleansed from your sin. And every time you remind yourself of that, you can break through condemnation and you can have an encounter with God. That's worth knowing. Another, another hurdle. After Moses said, well, who am I? <laughs> he actually said to God, who are you? Who are you? It's fascinating. Up to this point, Moses didn't really have a clue who God was. 
Moses says, you know, I've heard about you. I've heard about you. Our forefathers uh, talked about your great promises to Abraham. But lately, it, it looks like you've abandoned us because we've been here in Egypt in slavery for 400 years. Look at Moses' conversation with God. He says, uh, Moses said to God, uh, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? I mean, Moses didn't even know God's name. He says, if I go back to the Israelites and they ask me your name, what am I going to tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And I, I got to tell you, for me, at first blush, that, that seems like a non-answer. I mean, it just seems like it's kind of, you know, a, a riddle or, or it's just, you know, I am who I am. Uh, honestly, I remember as a new believer, I thought, well, God's being kind of a smart aleck here. You know, what's your name? Put it in tame. Ask me again, I'll tell you the same. You know? No, no. Th th this is not a non-answer. This is God saying, y you want to know who I am? Well, just start asking, Moses. Start asking. And the answer is, I am. Uh, are, are you great? I am. Are you glorious? I am. Are you gracious? I am. Are you gentle? I am. Are you generous? I am. Are you righteous? I am. Are you trustworthy? I am. Are you kind? I am. Are you patient? I am. Are you faithful? I am. You know, there's nothing you can come up with. I am. This is what you're to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So the second barrier to encountering God is, is how big is your God? Because if, if you've got a, a small view of a small God, then, then you need a breakthrough. You need to break through doubt. Because okay? too many of us spend our prayer time telling God how big our problems are. When we really ought to be telling our problems how big our God is. You, know, you just start your prayer time by praising God for just how big he is. Every day, just look for new, fresh ways to appreciate and praise God for who he is. I, I just love in my prayer time to just get on a riff of, of who God is. God, you're my savior, you're my shepherd, you're my healer, you're my rock, you're my refuge, you're my sanctifier, you're my righteousness, you're my redeemer, you're my provider, you're my sustainer, you're my shield. I, I love this verse in Jeremiah 32, 17. Ah, Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. I show up with my problems, and God, here they are. Nothing's too difficult for you. Look out, problems. Here comes God. I got a big God. I'm believing him, and I'm going to break through when it comes to doubt. Number three. You know, first Moses focuses on himself. Who am I? And then God, who are you? And then he says, uh, focuses on other people, and he says, well, what if they... Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me? What if I go back and say, I was herding sheep out in the desert and a bush started talking to me and they will say, the Lord did not appear to you. Okay, here's the struggle. Here's the obstacle. We can let what other people think keep us from getting close to God. We can let what other people think keep us from getting close to God. It, you know, it, you're in this 40 days and you're leaning in. Are you worried about what other people are going to think if you encounter God and he starts changing your life? It happened in Jesus' day, John, John 12, 42. I think for me, this is just a sad verse. You know, Jesus is preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He's healing people, doing miracles. People are starting to believe in him. But there's a ruling class of religious people that, that are looking at him and they don't like what's going on. And it says here, nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him. Many of the, of the religious rulers believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, that was the hardline group that was opposed to Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him. They weren't letting anybody else know that they believed in him. For fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Put out of the synagogue. That, just, that didn't mean they just couldn't go to church anymore. I mean, that meant they couldn't shop in the market, meant they couldn't get water from the well, meant their kids couldn't go to school. I mean, they were social, spiritual outcasts. And they were afraid 
that if they confess their belief in Jesus Christ, they would become spiritual and social outcasts. For they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. You know, it, it, it's a hurdle that many of us, many of us struggle in our day. In this cancel culture, you know, do you care more about what people think or do you care more about what God thinks? And so, so we need a breakthrough. We need a breakthrough in regards to fear. Fear. We're, we're too concerned about what other people think and we're not concerned enough about what God thinks. And you've got to make a choice. You know, is, is fear of other people, uh, is that going to keep you from encountering God? Are you ashamed of what they'll think? Paul says in Romans 1.16, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. First for the Jew, then for the Gentile. So who am I? Well, I'm a child of God. Who, who are you? I am. Well, what if they? So what? <laughs> you know? Uh, you don't worry about them. Worry about God's approval. You'd think Moses would be done, but he's got one more. Number four, he says, I have never, I have never, in order to have an encounter with God, you're going to have to do something that you've never done before. Because there's a step of faith. There's a step of trust that you need in order to encounter God. Uh, Exodus 4, Moses said to the Lord, O oh Lord, I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. And once again, Moses is saying, you got the wrong guy. You got the wrong guy. He says, God, I, I can't do this. I can't be your spokesperson. I don't speak well. And there are some who, who read into this that, that Moses stuttered or stammered or had some sort of a, a, of a speech affirmity. But he's telling God, he says, you've picked the wrong guy. I don't, I don't like to do this kind of thing. I'm not good at it. Why does God do that? You read through the scripture, and God seems to pick out people who are bad at something and then says, this is what I want you to go do. <laughs> Why does he do that? Because God rewards faith. In fact, until you get used to taking steps of faith, you're never going to have the best that God has for you. And so we've got a breakthrough. We, we, we need a, a spiritual breakthrough in regards to reluctance. We've got to overcome our own reluctance. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what God's called me to do. I know what God wants me to do. I just don't do it. And maybe God's been asking you to forgive someone. Maybe he's been asking you to break a bad habit. Maybe he's asking you to start a good habit. Maybe he's asking you to serve or to give or to do something different, something strange. And you think, well, you know, my kids are little, so I'll wait till the kids start school, and, and, and then I'll have time to do that. And then the kids get in school, and the schedules get all busy, and you think, you know, once the kids graduate and get out of the house, well, then... Then, then, then I'll do that. And, or, you know, it's September, coming on October. You think, well, you know, I could do it now, but I'll wait till January. Wait till the first of the year, fresh start, New Year's resolution. That, that's when I'll do it. You know, or, or you know, I'll, I'll just wait till I'm a little older, until life's a little more settled down. And all the old people in here go, settled down, what are you thinking? And, uh, and then one day you wake up and you think, you know, I, I, I'm too old to do it. And so it's a reluctance that becomes an obstacle that keeps you from encountering God. Uh, look at Hebrews 11.6. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You've got, you've got to break through. You've got to break through that reluctance, break through that doubt and fear. Step out in faith if you're going to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. God likes it. God likes it when you move toward the burning bush. I may not understand it. It may be strange to me. I may be afraid. But when you draw near to God, God draws near to you. You encounter God and your life is never the same. Now, I just want to tell you as your pastor, I truly believe that you're going to need this in the days ahead. 
I just, I believe we're all going to face situations in the future, and maybe the not too distant future, where if you don't understand that you serve a living, active, present, powerful God, this world is going to crush your spirit. But if you encounter that living, active, present, powerful God, it changes everything. It did for Moses, it'll do it for you. Let's pray together. God, I would just pray for us as a church family. I, I would just pray for, for the breakthroughs that we need. And maybe you're here today and you just, you just need the breakthrough of salvation. You just need to turn your life over to, to God and say, God, I trust in your son Jesus Christ as my Savior and I need you to forgive me of my sins and give me a new life. Give me an eternal life. And God promises if you cry out to him that he'll hear your cry and he'll save you. He'll give you a new life. And maybe you're here today and, and, and you just need to get a, a bigger view, a better perspective of how big God is. And you've been focusing on your problems and they've been scaring you to death. And maybe it's time for you just to stack those problems up against a great, big, powerful God and watch those problems just shrivel up. There's nothing that's too difficult for God to do. Nothing is impossible with God. Father, we thank you for that hope. And maybe you need a breakthrough in the area of fear. Maybe it's time for you to just get your eyes off other people and get them onto God, to just live your life for an audience of one. God, I, I, I'm going to seek your approval. I, I, don't, I don't care about the approval or disapproval of other people. I'm, I, want, I want to hear well done, good and faithful servant from you. And I'm praying during this 40 days that we'll have a breakthrough in regards to reluctance. That there will be just a move in each of our hearts that says, God, it's time. I've been putting this off. I've been putting it off. And it's time. It's time for me to step out on faith and to do what you've called me to do. God, we thank you for the victory that we can have in areas of our life as we yield them to you. Thank you for loving us. God, you are so loving. You are so tremendously good to us. We thank you for that. Just pray your blessing on these dear, dear people. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining us today. We would love for you to get connected to what's going on at Rockbrook Church. Visit us online at rockbrook.org for service times, small group information, and other ways you can discover your purpose here on earth.